In chapter 35 of the book of Ezekiel, we're actually not going to read it because we addressed these things a couple weeks ago. In chapter 35, Ezekiel returns back to the judgment on Edom and actually refers to it as Mount Seir, which was a mountain in Edom. Edom being the descendants of Esau uh, in an area to the uh, east and south of Israel. And they had been uh, enemies of Israel all along, and they had, uh, uh, they had joined with Babylon in destroying Jerusalem and enjoyed that. And for centuries they had been at odds with Israel. And their judgment came. And as I said, we discussed this back in uh, chapter 25 when we looked at that. But take a look at verse 10 of chapter 35. It says, Because you have said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess them although, although the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will do according to your anger and according to the envy which you showed in your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are desolate. They are given to us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me and multiplied your words against me. I've heard them. Thus says the Lord God, The whole earth will rejoice when I make you desolate. As you rejoiced because the inheritance of the house of Israel was desolate, so I will do to you. You shall be desolate, O Mount Seir, as well as all of Edom, all of it. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Interesting that the Lord says through Ezekiel, then they shall know that I am the Lord when I judge you. He's not saying, so you will know that I am the Lord. He's saying, so they will know, so that Israel will know because we are now moving into a new part of the book of Ezekiel where we begin to see the hope. We sang a wonderful song about hope this morning and you know what Kristen and I don't plan this stuff. Seriously, and yet it seems every Sunday someone the Holy Spirit of God is planning things. And this new song that we sang, my hope is in you. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. I won't be shaken by drought or storm. The peace that passes understanding is my song, and I sing, my hope is in you, Lord. Now, uh, I have uh, endured some storms, though I can't remember one. Uh, I can remember one where I was not in a house or some other shelter during the storm. I did many, many years ago decide to go... Uh, uh, I guess you could call it camping. We really didn't know what in the world we were doing, and it was before Christ days, so we were just making our minds stupider and stupider with the things that we would ingest or smoke or whatever. And so we decided we were going to go camping down uh, at Cheat Lake in Morgantown, or near Morgantown. Now, any of you that have ever been down in that area you know, around the lake there are these ginormous boulders. I mean, as big as this building right alongside the lake. So we got down there and we had, like, uh, the one girl who went along, she had a little suitcase, right, for camping. And uh, we did not have a tent. We had uh, sort of sleeping bags, blankets, kinds of things, and a little bit of food. And we're, man, this is, you know, get back to the land kind of thing, you know. It's what us hippies did, and we went down there, and, you know, it's it's like this everywhere. So where we ended up setting up our camp to sleep was on one of these ginormous rocks. We did not have any bedding other than the blankets, and it was not very comfortable at all. But we sat there, and we tried to make good when it was time to go to sleep, and then about 3 a.m., it began to pour down rain. I mean, just, and we were all there, and it was like a mile walk back to the car, so we're like, you know, just get underneath the blanket, you know. Well, this will end in a minute. And after about two hours straight of just downpour, we said, all right, that's it. You know, we're just totally soaked. But even that, I, I was not in danger for my life. I was not concerned about, 
you know, whether I would live till the next day. I was real unhappy and wet and cold and uh, not having any fun. And this says, you know, I won't be sh- shaken by drought or storm. This isn't talking about getting a little wet on a camping trip. This is talking about those things that jeopardize life. Israel saw no hope at this point. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The news was just about to come, but it was already a done deal. Jerusalem was already destroyed, and those in Babylon were about to hear the details of that. But already they had seen the decline and the decline and the overrunning by Babylon and the fact that they are taken captive and sitting in another land and separated from the temple of God and from all that they had known and from the land that had been given to Abraham and his descendants as an inheritance forever. And they are separated from all that sitting in a foreign land. They had no hope. And here the Lord begins to give them some hope. And the first thing He says, He talks about judging Edom for what they had done to Israel so that Israel would know that He is the Lord. That it isn't just about slapping the hand of someone who does something wrong, but of actual eternal justice. Judgment and justice come from the same word. Come, They're tied together linguistically. But we think of judgment as, oh, okay, that's when I get caught and something bad happens to me. That's judgment. But it's about justice. And our God is just. And He brings justice. But He not only brings justice, He brings hope and hope of restoration. In 1975, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I was changed and restored from how far I had gone from the Lord. And many times in the years since then, I have found myself to varying degrees needing to be restored again. Because I've been diverted on my way. Jesus said, stay on the narrow way. The way to salvation, the way to eternity with me, it's narrow. It's not the broad way. Anybody can find the broad way. Boy, it's smooth. It's straight. Just go. But the narrow way is hard. It says, narrow is the way. Straight is the gate. And few there are who find it. And I would say it's kind of easy if we let ourselves get diverted into the flesh to take a step to the right or to the left of that path. But there is a process of restoration and Israel right now is going to begin hearing the promise of restoration. And not just the restoration of, okay, 70 years of captivity, then you get to go back to the land. No, this is looking way forward to things that are happening today and that will be happening in the near future. So we pick it up in chapter 36, starting to read at verse 6. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains. Now he had just brought judgment on Mount Seir, and now he speaks to the mountains of Israel. Say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But you, O mountains of Israel... You shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Yes, 
I will cause men to walk on you. My people Israel, they shall take possession of you, and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you bereave them of children. Proverbs 13, 2 says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And if you've ever been in that situation where you had hope in something that was delayed or you saw no possibility of it, well, there's a sickness that comes in the heart. It just kind of, oh, that's, that's not what I wanted. But there's a second half to that verse that often doesn't get quoted. It says, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. You see, Though Israel was in the midst of receiving God's judgment, he says, I am for you. I am for you. Now that would be hard to hear, sitting in Babylon, having lost everything that you know, your whole heritage as a nation, as a people, your culture, that which you built your culture around religiously and socially, the temple, Jerusalem, all of these wonderful things, they're gone and you're sitting there would be hard to think that God is for you, especially since he has been talking through the prophets for a hundred years on why he's against you. But he's against the things that they had done. And judgment had to come because God is a just God. But here he says he is for them. You know, there are times when we may find ourselves under the chastening of the Lord. The chastening of the Lord. But it is for our own good. And God is not against us. He is for us. The discipline of a loving parent is motivated by love. The discipline of a loving parent is motivated by love. I've said before that we determined and we practiced it Uh, consistently to make sure that we told our children when they were young and we disciplined them, that we were doing it because we loved them. If we didn't love them, you could get away with this and we wouldn't care. But we love you, so therefore, no, you will pay the penalty for your actions. They didn't like that at the time. You know, I don't think I ever said, maybe you can correct me, but I don't think we ever said, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Because I always thought that was actually kind of a stupid thing to say. Because they don't really understand that. And in physical terms, if it's physical uh, discipline, well, no, it doesn't. Unless, like my son at two years old, when Krista uh, went to discipline him, he managed at the last minute to take the symbol from his little drum set and put it right there. So she... In that case, maybe it did hurt her more than it did him. But the point being, we didn't do it out of anger. We didn't do it out of some kind of anything. But our love for them, our love that said, you need to know and you need to understand the way God has set this world in motion. And therefore, you need to know that there is justice. And therefore, you need to know that there is grace, too. So we always made it a habit that if there was a punishment of, you know, okay, two weeks without this or without that, well, there was time off for good behavior. So that if there was quick and if you brought forth the fruits of repentance uh, early on, well, okay, then after a week and a half, you know, time off for good behavior. But that is God's way. God's chastening is not to make us feel pain and just to get back at us for making him feel bad. God's chastening is because he loves us enough to chasten us. And it is a chastening. If you are a child of God, you are chastened, but you don't stop being a child of God. That doesn't happen. It's based, the hope that Israel had was based on God's promises. 
many of which we're going to start hearing here in a minute, which hope that is based on God's promise is a hope that doesn't make the heart sick. It is a tree of life because God's promises are sure and absolute. And that hope is based on God's righteousness, not an earning of God's favor. Take a look at verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. And therefore, I I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols, which with they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they've gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you have went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Now, how many times did he say the word profane there? A number of times, right? You have profaned my name among the nations. You have profaned my name among the nations. You've been scattered among all the nations and you've profaned my holy name. But what he's not saying is, yeah, you've gone and you've taken the name of the Lord in vain. Or you have not given honor to the Lord necessarily it's not what he's saying here it's not what he's saying here verse 20 gives us the key to this when they came to the nations wherever they went they profaned my holy name when they meaning the nations said of them meaning israel these are the people of the lord and yet they've gone out of his land it's the nations looking at the jews and saying oh so You're the children of God. Boy, God's really treating you really well, hasn't He? This is not just speaking about during their time in Babylon. This is talking about every century and decade since that time until the last century. And Jews have been scattered into all of the world. Did you know that there are ethnically Jewish Japanese There are. And in every nation of the world, you can find Jews, ethnic Jews. When we went to Israel back in 2004, and we went with a friend and we spent a week up in a kibbutz in Galilee, in in the northern part of Israel, they were part of one of the first kibbutz uh, that were established in the land back in 1948 or 49 is when they came and they were established. They're from Ireland. They're Irish Jews. Ethnically Jewish. Not Irish who converted to Judaism, but ethnic Jews who had been scattered to all of the world and so therefore had grown up among the Irish, sure and begoren. I'm not sure what that means. I hope it's not a curse word or anything. <laughs> Matt, you might have to research that and edit this out, okay? Thanks. And among all the nations for centuries, the Jews have been persecuted. When you read the history of the Jews, after having been scattered, it's a phenomenal record of persecution at the hands of many different people 
including Christians, including ordained, sanctioned persecution, sanctioned by the church. It's amazing. We in this century, at least me in in my century, because my dad uh, fought in World War II, although in the uh, in the Pacific theater, not in the European theater. Yet World War II was was very real and 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 close to my heritage. I mean, it it ended only seven years before I was born. So I knew the story of what happened in in Europe. And I knew about the Nazis, and as I grew older, I came to understand the horrible atrocities that happened during the Holocaust. There's a book that was written, I forget the guy's name, it's called The Foot of Pride. It's not a Christian book, but it is a, it is a history of the Jews through most of the Middle Ages in Europe, and it begins in the foreword with a story about the trials at Nuremberg. And the trials at Nuremberg, uh, one of the Nazi uh, higher uh, generals or so forth was sitting there. And as part of his defense, as part of what his statement was, was, why are you judging us Nazis? We have only done and perfected that which Europe has done for the last six centuries. And he's absolutely right. It's amazing. It's a special hatred of the Jews that is inspired straight from the pit of hell because God in His eternal wisdom said, I pick you. I'm, I'm Abraham, move, move, move out of uh, Ur of the Chaldees and get over here and I'm going to give this land to you and your descendants. I know you don't have any kids, but I'm going to give you kids. When you're so old that you'll know that the only way you have kids is because I gave them to you. And then we have the whole history of the establishing of a nation and a setting up of a nation. They were chosen by God. Not because they had earned something, but because God determined, I pick you. That's why. But God had picked them. And He has still picked them. And we've read the promises of God that says, you know, when the sun stops rising and setting, that's when my promises to the nation of Israel will be at an end. That's when you'll know no more promises. They are true and amen for eternity. They are God's chosen people. And they've proven that it wasn't because of their actions. As we read throughout the history of the nation of Israel in ancient times, we prove it. And God scattered them to all of the earth, throughout all of the earth. And they were chased. And as Ezekiel says here, His name was profaned in the nations because of them. Because people said, you're a Jew? You're chosen of God? You're so... Yeah, boy, God must be really something. Look at how well he's treating his kids. Right? And so God's name was profane. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's saying here. And the church tried all kinds of things to figure out, well, how can we, you know, uh, protect God's reputation here? Because with, with the Jews and stuff. So, okay, I've got it. We are Israel. We, we, you know, the Jews had their chance. They missed it, so now we are Israel. That's wrong. It's wrong. There's nowhere in the Scripture where it says we become Israel. It does say that we are grafted into the promises of God, but we're grafted in. We're adopted. We're not part of that lineage. Maybe you are. There may be some of you here who uh, are ethnically Jewish. I don't know. But as Christians, we are grafted into the promises of God. But now we come to what the process of restoration is. Listen to this. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, 
from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. and Put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees, the increase of your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. And then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast day. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel by the inspiration of God, just laid out the process of restoration. Applied to the nation of Israel, to the nation of Israel. But it can just as easily be applied to the restoring of one to become adopted as a child of God. Or restored once again, having set a foot off to the right or to the left. And it goes like this. First, it's a return to the land. That's verse 24. So God takes them from all over the earth and gathers them in the land. And that is still occurring. I believe that this prophecy right here has been and is being fulfilled right now. 1948, the nation of Israel was granted nation status by the United Nations and has been a nation ever since and is growing. And there's been an exodus from all the nations of the world into Israel. And it's, it's grown and the people are coming back. The people are coming back and recognizing, coming back to Israel. The land was promised to Abraham's heirs through Jacob, who's, as you know, his... His God-given name was Israel. And God's promise of salvation is open to all mankind and He will gather anyone from anywhere into His kingdom if they're willing to respond. In the same way that God has bringing back miraculously, and it has never occurred in all of history, bringing back His people into the land promise, God's promise of a place where His people, the kingdom of God can dwell, is open to anyone and everyone who is willing to respond. Come unto Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, said Jesus. First of the four steps is to return, is to return. The second step in verses 25 and 26, sprinkling. I will sprinkle you with clean water. I will cleanse you. Speaking of spiritual cleansing. And what's very important is first he gathers the willing, then he cleanses. We get so hung up and we understand and study grace and, and, and know all this and maybe speak it to others, but invariably we come to that place in our own lives and we say, I can't return until I clean myself up. No, return first, then be cleansed. The way it's said in the book of Ephesians, Paul says to 
B, to take off the old man, be renewed, and put on the new man. Think about the verbs there. Put off the old man. That's a command for us to do something. Take it off. Return. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You can't make that happen. God does that. He changes us. And then put on the new man. Continue and walk in it. The cleansing is a change of heart. The the cleansing is a change of heart. We can change our mind. We can change our will. But we can't change our heart. That's why a lot of people have trouble sometimes with forgiveness. Because they really don't feel like forgiving someone. They don't really feel like that wrong has been righted. I'll I'll forgive them when I feel like it. When I feel that I can. But that's not right. It's a matter of will. It's a choice first, and then our heart is changed in that cleansing. Return first. Return first. There's nowhere you can go that is too far from the Lord. Corey Ten Boom said, There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper. Third step empowered by the Spirit, verses 27 and 28. Empowered by the Spirit to do what? Enabled to walk in His statutes, keep His judgments or decrees. That's judgments in the sense of judging what is right and wrong. And to do them. Enabled to do that and to dwell in the land. And in the same way we, this is, this is how it goes for us. It is by His Spirit that we are empowered to walk this Christian life. That's why it's so frustrating to say, well, I'm going to be a good Christian person and I'm going to do this. And then you fall on your face because you can't do it. But empowered by God's Spirit, you can. He enables us to walk in His statutes, to keep His judgments. Not just His Word, but when His Spirit abides within us, we come to those places. Well, well, let's see. uh, um, You know, actually, the Scripture doesn't say anything about marijuana. Did you know that? It actually doesn't even say anything about smoking marijuana. It's natural. Right? They grew up out of the ground that God created. So, what's wrong with it? Okay, but God says a lot of stuff about being clear-headed and seeking Him. And be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't go after that which is a physical stimulant or a mental stimulant, but seek after the Lord. Oh, Okay. Keeping His judgments. And do them. And do them. Jesus said, the one who hears My Word and puts them into practice is the one who built a good foundation for the house. I think it's James who said, let us not be just hearers of the Word, but let's be doers of the Word. I've met a lot of people who have probably memorized more Scripture than I have but it's not part of their life. It's not how they walk in this world and they wonder why stuff just isn't so good. And here's why. Because as you do this, as you're empowered by Him to do this, then you are empowered to dwell in the land, He says. Abiding in Him. This isn't just about a, man, I overcame that and that's it. No, this is about a day by day, by step by step, a continuous walk in the Lord. Abiding in Him. It's a long-term, consistent walk, not a roller coaster ride. There are a lot of Christians who are taking a roller coaster ride, hitting the heights, then going down to the depths, and back up to the heights, and then back down to the depths, and round the bend. God calls us to a steady, step-by-step walk with Him. And yeah, there's some twists and turns, and things get exciting sometimes, but it shouldn't become exciting and stimulating because we are not abiding in Him. And often, that is why as many twists and turns come. And what happens in verses 29 through 36 is we're provided with His bounty. You see, there is a bountiful life. 
that God has promised you. A bountiful life. I'm not talking about lots of money and cars and big houses. I'm talking about bounty of true life. Jesus said, hey, I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. I'm not just going to give you a little bit of life. I'm going to give you abundant life. But if we're not abiding in Him, we're going to miss the abundant life. And so many believers are left in that place trying to do it on their own or feeling like I've been separated as soon as I can clean myself up enough and do enough stuff and read the Bible often enough and get to church. Off, well, then I'll approach the Lord. No, come first. Come first. And the rest follows. The rest follows. And the other part of that is talks about the tilling of the land and the rebuilding of the land. You know, that doesn't happen. It didn't happen when they returned from Babylon. Just magically, oh, look, all our houses are rebuilt. Isn't this cool? And look, somebody tilled the land for us. Oh, we just have to go We just have to go pick the trees. No. There's an action and activity on our part. Absolutely. But He empowers us to be able to do that. I believe the return in 1948 is the return of verse 24. I believe that. But the remaining steps are yet to be fulfilled on a national level for Israel. No, they have not been cleansed as a nation. No, the Spirit of God is not upon them as a nation. The amazing bounty of what's happening in Israel, if you go there, it is. It's become a, it's become a garden instead of a wasteland, which it was. But nothing like it's going to be when the Lord comes. Chapter 37 is a very familiar one. And we'll end here. Let me read quickly verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And He caused me to pass by them all around. Behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry, meaning they'd been there for a long time. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. And I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you and you shall live and then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together. Bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. And he said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. And I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I, am the, that I the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. This is not talking about the resurrection of the dead. Although this idea of coming up out of the graves and being resurrected. But this is not talking about the resurrection of the last day. This is using the image of Israel was dead like a battlefield from long ago. And all you can see is old dried up bones. Israel had been buried in all of the nations of the earth. And God raised them up and he's brought them and is bringing them back into the land. And the next steps will be the cleansing and will be the Spirit of God pouring out and then the bountiful time of the Lord. And we'll hear more about that in the chapters coming. What I want to leave you with is hope. Because God is not limited. He can do all things. 
When I read this chapter, there's an image in my mind from a book that my father had called The Rise and the Fall of the Third Reich. And in there, there were a couple of photographs that as a young boy, they were chilling. Photographs of bones, human bones, from those who had gone through the Holocaust, from those who had been destroyed in the battles. And I can still see those pictures in my mind. And when I come to this passage, I think of that. And I think of being a Jew during those days and saying, for centuries it has come to this, and now the ultimate solution, the final solution it was called by the Nazis. I think there is no hope. This is impossible. We are nothing but dry bones. <laughs> but then there's a rattling. And they begin to be assembled together and flesh put on them and life comes in. And it's a wonderful picture of what God is in the process of doing in the nation of Israel. But even more, it is a wonderful picture of what God does to us. When we come, if we come to Him first, that's what He does. And no matter how far removed some circumstance or some part of your life may seem from the Lord, it may look like a valley of dry bones. Yet the Lord causes that as we turn to Him to be built back together and life brought Come to the Lord first. Wherever you are in whatever part of your life experience seems like a valley of dry bones, come to the Lord first and see Him bring life to it. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for the promises and the sure promises of Your Word. Lord, as we consider our own valleys of dry bones. Lord, I pray that You would help us to bring them to You and to watch You bring life to those dry bones. Lord, help us to walk through all four of those steps of restoration by first coming to You and then being cleansed and given a new heart about whatever the situation is. And then given Your Spirit and empowered by Your Spirit to not only walk in Your ways, but to abide in You. And then know the bountiful, abundant life that You give. Lord, help us to walk in that way so that we would not profane Your name in the nations in which we live, but we would be lights shining like a city on a hill cannot be hid and declaring the goodness of our God. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you, grant you peace. May He lift up His countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior and our soon coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.